Hey, what's up, everybody? Today, we're giving away access to Maps Prime, but in order to get free access, you have to leave a comment in the first 24 hours to help us with the YouTube algorithm. We're trying to let the world know that we're awesome. We want everybody to know that we're awesome, but we need your help. Leave a comment. If it's a comment in the first 24 hours, and if we like your comment, you may win free access to Maps Prime. Isn't that cool? Also, uh, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications. You got to do those two things. And one more thing before we start the podcast, and you're going to love this podcast. We talked to a real cardiologist about the latest research on heart health, and this guy lifts weights. He's also a trainer. Really, really cool guy. All right, so check this out before we get to the podcast. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle. All of those are 50% off. Go check them out. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code June Prime with no space for that discount. All right, here we go. Let's do this podcast. So, Dr. Allo, I, I, I met you recently. Um, I was on your podcast. You interviewed me about the book that I wrote, and you've been listening to the show for a little while. You're a cardiologist, and when we started talking, um, it was great because we had a lot of similar, I guess, opinions and understandings about health and longevity. And, and you know, I've, I've, I have a lot of friends that are doctors, and oftentimes, sometimes we're at odds, um, but a lot of stuff that you were, we, we were talking about were very similar. I'd like to talk about the changes in our understandings of heart health, and there have been a few. I, I remember when uh, we were dietary cholesterol, for example, was a big topic. We were told to avoid it for a while. What does the current research say? What do you tell your patients about things like that? What, is, what does that look like? So dietary cholesterol, um, it used to be a thing. We used to tell people don't eat more than 300 milligrams a day and try to avoid it. You know, Don't eat that many egg yolks. Um, but as it turns out, dietary cholesterol in and of itself is not a problem. They've done studies where they feed people tons of dietary cholesterol, whether it's shrimp or egg yolks or you know whatever it is. Um, your total cholesterol is not going to go up that much, nor, nor your LDL. LDL is obviously the bad cholesterol. But saturated fat, we found, actually does raise your cholesterol. Saturated fats are fats that are solid at room temperature, butter, bacon, cheese, chicken skin, steak fat, all the good stuff. That actually does raise your cholesterol, but don't worry about it. If you're, the studies that they've done where uh, people are leaner and fitter and healthier, um, the effect of, of saturated fat is not as much on them. Um, where somebody's like really overweight, obesity causes inflammation. It's the number one cause of heart disease, strokes, you know, peripheral heart disease, all that stuff. Um, when you're obese, your inflammation level is higher. Um, you your IL six is higher. Your you know CRP, all the you know all the stuff we measure um, to measure inflammation as much as we can. I mean, it's not the best, you know, it's not perfect, but the, all the ways we have of measuring inflammation in blood tests are all higher when you're obese. The more obese you are, the higher it is. Um, so we found that people who are more overweight, um, things like LDL. Uh, or, or I mean, saturated fat, things like saturated fat affect them more. They're more likely to have heart attacks, more likely to have strokes. I mean, it's common sense too. Mm. But the more overweight you are, the less fit you are, the more likely that is to affect you. When they've done studies, large, large population studies on people um, eating uh, saturated fat and then checking their, their cholesterol levels, they found when they corrected for BMI, like uh, where, where, you know, we looked at, you know, the lean, you know, super lean people, people kind of a little bit overweight, more overweight, obese, morbidly obese, whatever. Um, they found that people with within the same BMI, um, if your BMI was lower, the less likely they are for that to make a difference. So if you're lean and fit, like you know, probably most of your audience, or maybe not, I don't know. Mm. But like if like you guys and and you know people who are pretty lean and fit, if you ate more saturated fat, it, it, up to a certain degree, it doesn't raise your LDL or, or cause cardiovascular mortality. You can get away with it uh, more. There's a lot you can get away with when you're actually leaner and more fit. Um, They've, they've done studies where they looked at fitness versus fatness. Um, they looked at, they, 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 used, they would think that, you know, like, like one study they did where they looked at normal weight people who were fit. Um, people who were either normal weight or overweight and unfit, like they didn't exercise, they didn't do anything, had two times higher cardiovascular mortality. Whereas if you took overweight people and made them fit, like they would run a few miles a day or whatever, whatever fitness is defined as, they're, they're active, they're doing things, their uh, cardiovascular risk and mortality went back down to what a normal weight fit person would be. So you can be fat and fit. It's not as good as being normal weight and fit, but it's not that far off. Well, well how, now how, how much of an individual variance is there with a lot of this stuff? Because for example, for me, I, now obviously I work out and do all that stuff. 
my diet typically is very high in saturated fat. Um, and whenever well, it's I get probably my, not as high as you think. Mm. Like you know, you you said. I mean, we've talked about this. You talk about it on the podcast all the time. You eat red meat, yeah, whole quite foods. Often. Yeah, you're yeah. eating whole foods. Yeah. You're not eating you're McDonald's. Eating, yeah, you're not eating like hamburger, you know, mm. or whatever it is. But even if you did, if you're fit and lean, it's not going to affect you as much. And you're probably not eating as much saturated fat as before. Um, in in Finland, there was this area. They, they did a study on saturated fat. Um, there was this area called North Karelia in in the northern part of Finland. It was a rural town, farm town. All they ate was eggs and milk and cheese and lots of dairy, lots of saturated fat. Their cardiovascular mortality was the highest in the world. They had about 700 people die for every 100,000, which at that time in 1972, it was the highest mortality uh, on earth for mm. people. So they the, the, the country said, hey, you know, we got to reduce this. This is crazy. Um, so they put in a lot of public health measures. They wanted to reduce smoking. About 60% of men used to smoke at the time. 12% of women smoked at the time. Um, there was some obesity. They got people to lose weight. And they followed that out about up to 2007 and then again up to 2014 and 18. They found that that at the time when it started, people would 23% of their calories were coming from saturated fat. I'm sure not your you know, you're not eating 23% of your calories from saturated fat, although okay. I, don't, I don't follow you around, so mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but they reduced it down to about 10%. And they and, and they did lose weight, not not a whole lot. And, and in some people, they actually gained weight. But they did reduce smoking in men from 60% uh, down to about 16 Women's smoking rate stayed about the same. They bumped up a little in the 90s because it was cool to smoke. You know, women started saying, feeling like, you know, they want to smoke. And then it dipped back down again. Um, but they found that they reduced cardiovascular mortality to only 100% out of 100,000. It was an 84% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, and they attribute the majority of that to the reduction in saturated fat intake. They went from 23% down to about 10, slightly more. And then when they when they did a subgroup analysis where they looked at just the women, because their weight didn't change a whole lot. And their smoking didn't change. And their smoking went up right. at one point and then back down. They found that even they reduced oh, wow. their cardiovascular mortality uh, that much. So there is a huge difference. Now, the, the number one thing I always tell my patients or when I'm giving talks, um, the top 10 things you can do to reduce cardiovascular mortality or like the top 10 things you can do to improve your heart health, number one would be to quit smoking. Can you guess number two? Exercise. <laughs> Number two would be to quit smoking. Number okay. three, to quit smoking. <laughs> All the first it's like ten, Fight Club. Wow. Yeah. The first ten things you can do to improve your cardiovascular mortality or your heart health would be to quit smoking. Wow. After that, the next biggest one is to get to as close as your ideal body weight as possible. Not that many people smoke in the U.S. anymore. It's about eighteen and nineteen percent. The biggest problem now is obesity. We have. Yeah. According to the CDC's latest, about 80% of our country is overweight, 42% is considered obese, and even in children now, uh, the obesity rates are approaching 20% in some ages. Um, you know, five to seven years old, it's about 12%, up to about 17, 18. So we have even like rates of 20% or even more. And they're almost adults at that point. Um, but obesity would be the next thing. So smoking gives you a 20, 20 times risk of, if we took your exact twin, and he smoked and you didn't, his rates of heart attack and stroke would be 20 times higher than yours. Mm. If we took your exact twin and he was overweight uh, and you weren't, his rates of heart attack and stroke would be 10 times higher. So those are the two uh, main things we want to reduce. And there's no doubt about it, saturated fat raises your LDL. Um, there's like millions of studies on this. Mm. Um, and there's no doubt that high LDL may not be what's causing the heart attacks or strokes in and of itself, but it highly correlates with it because we know an LDL below 57, there's zero cardiovascular mortality. If we got your LDL down to 57, um, there's zero cardiovascular mortality. You will not die. We have something in cardiology we call the 60-60-60 guarantee. If your LDL is below 60 and your HDL is above 60, which is your good cholesterol, and your triglycerides are below 60, triglycerides kind of measure your metabolic overall health, you know, how insulin resistant you are, the kinds of things you eat, you know, how overweight you are, those kind of things. If your triglycerides are below 60, you know, those three 60s line up, you will not die of a heart attack or stroke. There's zero cardiovascular mortality. Oh, interesting. Mortality. That is yeah. very interesting. And when, when we talk about uh, obesity uh, being one uh, one of the next to smoking, is it more is it more that the, the client is obese uh, and carrying X amount of body fat on them, or is it that they're probably taking an assault of, being in a calorie surplus 
ninety percent of the time that's why they're they're that way. Do you, can we tease that out in the studies to know like which one is? What What do you mean? So like when you when you say that they're they're a higher risk because they're obese versus somebody who is leaner, is it because the just because they have excess body fat? Yeah, or what? is it more of the constant assault of calorie surplus well, that the is the con- stress? The, the constant home? assault of calorie surplus leads to the obesity. It's not like they got obese because they're born that way. That's right. the other thing. A lot of my patients say, well, my family's all overweight. It's genetic. No, it's <clears> not. <throat> you inherited bad eating habits from your family. You grew up with your family and they eat more food than they should. Mom tells you you got to finish your plate. Whatever your habits are that you grew up with, you're overweight because of what you eat. Now, there's there are some people who genetically have to be obese. They're a very small percentage. They're people with short stature syndrome. They're like three, maybe four feet tall, or they call them dwarfs. Mm -hmm. Um, But short stature syndrome, they have to be obese. There's almost no way they can't be. Um, Their genetics are such. Now, if you're not one of those, you're mostly obese because you're eating too many calories. Mm. Um, So yeah, the calories lead to the obesity, which leads to the inflammation. Men who are obese, the adipose tissue stores and gives off estrogen, um, which causes more clots. Um, and 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 can lead to strokes and heart attacks. But and you notice that men who are uh, more overweight are like feminized almost. They have uh, breast man boobs yeah. and you know acne, facial hair, redness, you know all that kind of stuff. Um, lines in their uh, belly, like like almost like stretch marks, not from actually being overweight, but the kind of stretch marks people get when they have like diabetes or you know metabolic disorders. Um, so so definitely it's a it's a now there's a now I'm not trying explain to explain that doc a little bit. I've actually never heard anyone say that the difference in the stretch marks. What do you mean by that? So like? people who are diabetic or that are uncontrolled or, or or going into diabetes, like a lot of times you see this in kids. They have like really dark skin on their mm-hmm. neck. They and and you know mom's like I've been trying to wash, like wash it off for years yeah. and it won't go away. It's like, you know, this dark skin in the creases. Um, it's in their armpits too. Um, that's a sign. It's it's called acanthosis nigricans. It's a sign of being diabetic oh, or uncontrolled diabetes. And they also get these white lines in their belly. Um, you see these in, in kids or, or, you know, other people who are pretty diabetic, even though they never gave birth, never gained a ton of weight and lost it. Um, you see these white striations, they call them. They, they go up and down their belly. They get these dark marks under their armpits or in their neck creases. Um, like, you know, you'll see a kid, you're like, you know, this kid is diabetic. There's no way he's not. And then you ask the mom, like, yeah, you know, the doctor did say his blood sugar is a little bit elevated last time and we need to keep an eye on it. Um, but being overweight in and of itself, you know, obviously it's due to excess calories, um, is definitely, uh, more atherogenic it, it the inflammation causes all this now people say well my cholesterol is 300 i'm not having a stroke or heart attack well i mean it, it's a matter of time it, it, it might not be what causes it it's the inflammation high blood pressure that's the other thing they found with the finland study the majority of the reduction in mortality was due to the lowering of the saturated fat mm-hmm. the second most was lowering blood pressure men in that study had blood pressures well over 180 some of them over 200 yeah. they got those down into the 130s and then that made a huge difference because the, the blood pressure and the diabetes assaults the inside of your organs and arteries from the inside out you're, you're pounding uh, damaging the arteries the cholesterol just comes in like plaster and patches it up now can, can you explain to me um, basically how plaque forms in the arteries like you know there are genetic factors to that like what how does that all come about so the genetic factor there are some people who have genetically high cholesterol they're called it's called familial which is like family hypercholesterolemia super high cholesterol these people have cholesterols like four five six hundred the highest i've ever seen is like almost a thousand wow. one of my patients had a cholesterol of 998 like literally two points away from a thousand that's really genetic um but the, the damage in the arteries happens from all the other stuff. It, cholesterol doesn't damage your arteries. It actually patches it up. The blood pressure, the high blood sugars, those kind of things cause shearing stress, especially the, 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 the hypertension. It shears the arteries. Mm. You get little traumas and little damage in there, and then the cholesterol comes in, the LDL especially, to, to patch it up. So it's like scar tissueing in a sense. Imagine like I poke a hole, a, a hole in your, plaster, your walls and you patch it up with plaster and then you paint it. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what happens. Somebody damages your artery or the blood pressure. And then the cholesterol like patches it up. So the closer. cholesterol plaques are essentially your body's attempt at repair, a repair, and trying to make best with what's going on. Mm-hmm. So then, in that case, would lowering cholesterol or lower maybe through statins or whatnot, or lowering the body's ability to repair itself, could that also potentially cause more problems? 
or is it like a risk versus reward thing? At no. That point? So when you when you lower LDL or, or increase HDL, what happens is the HDL, the good cholesterol, goes in and scavenges back out the LDL. The problem when we patch it up is it's soft. Mm. It's not. Uh, hard it doesn't kind of heal properly so you've got these little patches of like b balloons or, or like bubbles of cholesterol hiding in there and if a one of those plaques ruptures which mm. eventually it does all that ldl comes out goes down into the artery plugs it up with platelets and all kinds of stuff um, and then you have a heart attack or if it happens in your brain it's a stroke um, so the the ldl builds up in there and then the hdl if you have good hdl and the only way you can raise that really is with exercise or a b vitamin called niacin um, it goes in and takes out the LDL so that then it heals up and it's like natural, you know, artery tissue. Um, but if you don't do that or, or there's more damage being done and you're still inflammatory and you're still, you know, overweight and all that, eventually those do rupture and that's how you end up with these massive heart attacks. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. let's, let's talk more about statins because it's a bit of a controversial, um, drug in the, I guess in the health and fitness space, I would say. Now I used to train a lot of doctors and surgeons and I remember one of my clients, uh, was a vascular surgeon. Now this was about 10 years ago. And I remember him saying, uh, boy, if they could put statins in the water, it would be amazing. It would solve, it would help so many things. I remember thinking like, is it really that great or is it more nuanced than that? Like, what is their value? Is it something that if you have just have high cholesterol, you should just take or is it, is it you know, much more complicated? So it depends. Um, statins are definitely one of the greatest inventions ever. Like I always tell my, my patients to say, oh, I don't want to take statins. I want to take something natural. Well, statins came from red yeast rice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it's lovastatin. That's what's in it. That's why those work. You can buy it over the counter. And I tell my patients all the time, like, you know, if, if, it, if you know, the, for supplements, for example, well, I want to take something natural. Like all the drugs we have came from something natural, like aspirin is willow tree bark mm -hmm. or oil of wintergreen, salicylic acid. Um, Coumadin is sweet clover. Uh, digoxin is comes from the digitalis flower, or, you know, the leaves of it. Um, lisinopril is a blood pressure medicine. It's the, one of the most common blood pressure medications. Guess where that came from? Where? Just guess. Lisinopril. <laughs> I'm trying to put yeah. the name together. <laughs> <laughs> no it has nothing to do with the name. Like alcohol? Super or something? Super fascinating. Uh, 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 it's viper venom. Oh, oh wow. yeah. yeah, we would have never guessed. <laughs> He's like, no. I'll wait. <laughs> I've heard about the snake venom. Trust me, you'll get it. It's yeah. viper venom. No, I've actually heard about that. That was because my third a viper, guess. When a viper bites, yeah, sure. When a viper, when a viper bites like a human, your blood, right? it injects a ton of this medicine called an ACE inhibitor, like lisinopril and allopril, all the prills. It injects a ton of this into you. Your blood pressure drops so low that you're not getting blood anymore to your organs, and then you die. So obviously, we don't give it at such a high dose. It's microscopic dose. Right. But we've taken all this stuff from nature and turned it into, you know, therapeutic medication. Like people come up to me and say, well, shouldn't I be taking fish oil? We have that. It's called Lovaza. If it works, we turn it into a medication. Turns out Lovaza, which is EPA and DHA, uh, raised your bad cholesterol too much. So then they split it. And now it's only the EPA portion. And now it's a drug called Vasipa. So there's actually a prescription drug called Vasipa, which lowers your cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality. So um, the fish oil that's unseparated is not as good as the one that's just EPA. Um, so I don't know. So we, I mean, pay, we tell that to patients all that. Now back to statins. So yeah, I didn't even yeah. answer your question. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> so statins, um, of all the medications we've ever invented, other, you know, other than aspirin, statins have the the best number needed to treat. In statistics and medicine, we talk about this number needed to treat. It's the number of patients you need to treat to prevent one death. So most of these medications, the number needed to treat is like 20,000, 3,000, you know, really high numbers in the thousands. The number needed to treat for statins is 40. For every 40 people on a statin, you save one life. So they're, they're very, very good. Now, there are some people that have fam familial, really high genetic cholesterol that statins aren't going to be enough and you need to put them on, you know, a bunch of other stuff too. But for the average patient, like 99% of my patients, a statin by itself will reduce cardiovascular mortality, uh, prevent them from dying almost, in, you know, at least not from a heart attack. And they work very, very well. There was a, there was a concern at one point in the time, maybe like 10, 10 years ago, probably when your patient talked to you, um, that they caused some neurocognitive alterations, like memory issues. But then they went back and looked at you know, over 200,000 uh, patients in all these databases and they found that statins did not uh, have anything to do with that people are, the people on statins are older 
and they're they're more likely they're not more likely than the general population to develop that if they were on a statin or not. They they just that's what you know. So why wouldn't are. we all supplement with statins then, like a fish oil? Why, why, why wouldn't it be a more regular? It, it may not be a bad idea. Really? <laughs> no, it depends on your cholesterol. Like you know, like I have patients that are that are like you know 30, 40 years old. They're like, my cholesterol is two ten, two twenty. I have a bad family history. Now, if you're not a smoker and you're fit and you eat healthy, it's not an issue. But if you're like a smoker and hypertensive and diabetic, look, mm. I don't want to be that guy that my cholesterol is 198 and right on the border, you know, why can't it be 110 or, you know, 120 mm. or 98? You know, now, why not get it down? How often do you have this conversation with people like that where they come to you, they're like, I smoke, I eat like shit, I don't exercise. Uh, Every and, day. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. Most do you have this conversation with them where you're like, what, what pill do I need? Yeah, we could give yeah. you this drug or, you know. So here's the thing. I have seen thousands of patients I, as you can imagine i tell them every day they have to lose weight they have to quit smoking they have to do all this and how many I, people listen and i give them resources <laughs> i'm like listen i'm here i will help you like i've sat down with patients and set up my fitness pal for them like mm -hmm. literally set it up put their calories in increase their protein because the ratios it gives you is not good enough did that with them and educate them for like an hour on they come back three months later yeah doc i tracked for two days and i stopped and then okay like don't track here's a way to do it without tracking clearly that's not working for you i give them ways to reduce their caloric intake without tracking i put them on stuff to help them quit smoking i i mean there's very there's a few patients that say you know what? i don't want to quit smoking i actually enjoy it okay fine we don't have to quit smoking but but they, but the vast majority do want to get better and healthier i always tell people the two most addicting substances known to man are nicotine and it is it's harder to quit nicotine than crack cocaine pain pills alcohol anything else they've ever tested nicotine is the hardest you talked about this in a recent podcast. <laughs> it, is. it is the hardest. But especially in cigarette form, uh, you know, because yeah. with the cigarette, it hits you hit. yeah. and you're doing it so often, you're like conditioning yourself on yeah. top of it. And I know you tried the lozenges and yeah. gums and whatnot, but that is the, because it alters your mind. Your mm -hmm. nicotinic receptors are in your brain. That's why I took it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I could feel it. It does work. Yeah. There's nicotinic receptors in your brain. They're, they're sort of in the same class as caffeine almost. Like it's really hard to quit caffeine. Oh, I, yeah. I tried. I had acid reflux and I had to quit for six weeks. I almost died. Mm. But it's super hard to quit nicotine. Mm -hmm. The second one is food, like calories. The second hardest thing to make people give up, not give up entirely, just cut a little bit, right. is food and calories. Mm -hmm. Um, but those two things would make the biggest difference in, in your health. I forgot what the original question was. Well, I actually want to talk about, cause you, you mentioned my fitness pal and I wasn't asked this earlier. So it's a good transition to this. If you let's pretend we actually have people that will track their food. Cause there's a lot of people in our audience that will, are there some generic parameters? Like, uh, as far as what you would tell them to, it's, you know, stay your saturated fat under this, or the, the, it should be only this. You know, it really doesn't even matter if you're total. So here's the other thing. If you're in a calorie deficit and you're losing weight, everything else makes no difference. Like all your cardiovascular risk factors that we can measure go down. Like they've done studies where people are in a calorie deficit, regardless of the portions of macronutrients. Like they've tested where like 10% of your calories are fat, 10% are carbs, 10% are protein. And then they play with all the other stuff. And then they switch it around. If you're in a calorie deficit and weight is coming off, Doesn't your matter. cholesterol goes down, your inflammatory markers go down, your insulin resistance improves, your blood sugar goes down, hypertension goes down. Mm -hmm. diabetes goes down regardless of what on earth you're eating if it's in a calorie deficit and weight is coming off not like i'm in a calorie deficit but you're still gaining weight yeah if weight is coming off all that stuff gets better that's why i was asking that question earlier is it sounds like i mean i know you alluded to that obviously the the calorie surplus is what re leads to obesity but it sounds like the thing that is the most detrimental is the surplus of calories consistently right yeah. and because even if you were an obese person if you immediately get into a calorie deficit all those factors become start better. improving right away right away like even even the studies where they've done only six weeks like all right let's put you in a calorie deficit and it's not even like a huge deficit they're not like uh 20 percent deficit 25 they're like in 10 maybe 15 percent deficit they're just slightly losing weight even in six weeks uh, we notice a huge, huge difference in their um, inflammatory yeah. markers and cardiovascular risk this, markers. This is why every single diet has been shown to improve to health. It's like, oh, you know, vegan, no, yeah. keto, no. Yeah. Carnivore. One thing they have in yeah. common, yeah. They're, sure. all, they're all low calorie. Now, now, here's the part, though, that I think is rarely discussed because, that, I mean, that's 100% right. We know that. Um, I, I say that all the time, like high sugar, high fat, whatever. Boy, the context makes a big difference. If you're in a deficit, it doesn't make nearly as big of a difference as if you're in a surplus. But here's where it does make a difference. 
how those foods affect your energy, your appetite, your cravings, uh, you and know. how you look in the end. Yes, yes, yes. Like you know, there's a, there's a. This is a. I'm sure you guys have read about this. There's something called the Twinkie Diet. Kansas State University professor, mm, I saw the that. head of nutrition, literally the head of nutrition, was eating lunch with his colleagues, and they're like laughing at him. They're like, "Dude, what are you eating?" And he's like, "I can eat whatever I want. What do you mean? They're like, you're eating junk food." He's like. I can lose weight on junk food. And they're like, no, you can't. He said, sure. And these are all his nutrition colleagues. He said, sure, you can. I'll show you. He, for the next three months, ate only Twinkies. He made sure he got 100 grams of protein a day because, you know, you have to. It's, mm-hmm. it's insane not to. And you end up being, you know, looking horrible. Yeah. He made sure he got, a, he got sh- you know, protein shakes and that was all. He got 100 grams of protein a day. And the rest of his food was basically Twinkies. And he lost 28 pounds in three months. And he's like, here, look at my food logs. Follow me around all day if you want. 28 pounds in three months eating 100 grams of protein a day and basically just Twinkies. Right, right. but of course I would argue unsustainable, probably would well, have yeah, cravings, that's probably want to eat more. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem with all, all these diets. Yeah. Like I always tell, like I, like I have this fictitious patient called Leslie, all right? <laughs> yeah, he asked, My, mine is Mrs. Johnson. Yeah, yeah. He asked me one day, he's like, he's like, Doc, what's the best diet for me? I said, it's called the Leslie diet. He's like, what? You know, what do you, what do you mean? What's the Leslie diet? I was like, it's your food that you like to eat. It just has to be less than what you're <laughs> currently eating. He's like, what do you mean? How do I do that? I was like, well, how do you eat now? Just eat whatever you eat now. It just has to be a lot less. Now, he's like 65, and he doesn't care to be a bodybuilder, you know, protein and all that. I told him, listen, if I give you a diet and I call it something else, you're going to do it for two or three months and then get bored from diet fatigue. Like all these diets, keto, whatever it is, I've done most of them. Atkins back in the day, I'm sure you guys remember that, or South Beach slightly after that it works. It works for a while and you do it. But then like, what do you do afterwards? Am I going to keep eating ribeyes for the rest of my life mm-hmm. or not, or eating grains, you know, paleo diet stuff that was available, you know, a hundred years ago or the, the hallelujah diet, the God diet. If God didn't make it, then don't eat it. Uh, like if it, it has to come out of the I ground. I heard that one. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. There's you just a eat manna. Guy. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> you eat like stuff that comes out of the ground. If, God, like a if right? God didn't create it, then you don't eat it. But mm-hmm. anyways, like, eat whatever you like to eat because that's the only way you're going to be able to do it long term. Like Justin's not going to eat what Adam likes to eat, what I like to eat. You know, it just doesn't work. Yeah. He doesn't um, like cheese as much as me. So. Yeah. It's not going to so work. Nobody does. Eat, no. what, <laughs> yeah. eat what, what you like to eat. I told Leslie, listen, bro, you just, not bro. Listen, Mr. Leslie. <laughs> you, hey, bro. You got to eat what, what you like to eat. Just it has to be less than what you're currently eating. And I give them all kinds of resources to help them with that. But the patients that actually do it, and you'll be shocked. Guess what? how many patients actually lose weight? Or I'm sure you guys know because you worked with clients forever. Maybe of the five thousand people I've seen, yeah. like ten percent, maybe or less, yeah. under twenty, uh, yes. hundred. Yeah. yeah, it's disheartening sometimes. But but they, but they really wanted it. Like you have to want it. Like I like I'll I'll give the patients the same spiel every time. Like listen, here's what you got to do, but you got to want it. I don't live with you. I can't force you to do this stuff. Same thing with smoking cessation. But here's what you can do. Do this at home. If you want to do it, I guarantee you, if you do this, you will lose weight. Yeah. But you have to want it. Yeah, you're dealing You're dealing mm-hmm. with, uh, I mean, just behaviors. It's just so oh, it's all behavior. Hard. It's so hard to change that in, in fundamental ways. And presenting people with all the information and statistics, it just doesn't matter. Even people's own mortality doesn't matter. It's the behaviors. And they're that seeing me because they have had cardiac problems. Like they almost died. Usually they had a and even that didn't give them an epiphany. Right. Well, I can't tell you. Like I've had people have three heart attacks. They're still smoking. Oh I mean, that's why it's so addicting. I mean, it, they're like, yeah, I quit for a couple, you know, a couple weeks after uh, my first heart attack, and then I was back at it. I mean, it's that it's super addicting. Same thing with people who lose weight. Like they'll like like all the gastric bypass patients. I mean, you rearrange their anatomy. They don't have an anatomy problem. They have a psychological, behavioral, ma- hand-to-mouth problem. They, you, you, you bypass their stomach temporarily. They lose weight for a year. You guys see them afterwards. What happens after that first year or two? They stretch yeah, that little tiny st- stomach back out. Which in is there. They're really- all back to overweight, some back to their beginning weight. I mean, yeah. it's good because you save their life. Like It's mm-hmm. called morbid obesity because it's you're going to die. That's what morbid means. But you saved their life temporarily. You gave, bought them a few years, but they have to want it. Like, like all my patients that eventually flip that switch, like doc, just one day I decided that was it. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with smoking cessation, it cold Turkey works the best. 48% of people who quit forever quit cold Turkey. The rest of the stuff is like, you know, random meds, acupuncture, like one or 2% here and there. Um, 
But if you flip that switch and you want to lose weight and you want to get healthy, uh, it works. And, and you can do it, but you have to want it. Yeah. You, have to. You, you, you obviously work out. You obviously lift weights. I know you listen to the show for a while. And when I talk to you- You run a 4.4, four, which is impressive. And too. Yeah, that's that's, in there. that's yeah. insane. Uh, yeah, smart and fast. I mean, geez, that you know, save some girls for the rest of us. But anyway, <laughs> right. we, we were, you know, when we were talking, we were talking a lot about the benefits of resistance training and strength training. And it's not typically, or at least not traditionally thought of as, an, as a form of exercise to improve cardiovascular health or, or heart health. How important is muscle in this or building muscle in this whole, you know, everything that we're talking about? Does it make a difference to have more strength yeah, and more so, muscle? Yeah, so they found that having more muscle improves cardiovascular mortality. It improves, like if somebody's sick, like chronically ill or, you know, really sick in the ICU, you're more likely to make it out of the ICU if you have more muscle, more lean body mass. Um, it also, they found that uh, resistance training improves bone mineral density. Like they, they do scans, the DEXA yeah. scans on hips. If you resistance train, it actually goes up. If you do aerobic exercise, it actually goes down. I mean, you, you talk about that one client of yours who mm -hmm. her doctor was like, oh my goodness, you know, your bone mineral density, your osteoporosis is improving, which we almost never see. We have medications for it. It helps slow it down and sometimes reverses it. And they're all like, you know, infusions usually. Yeah, she was on, I think it was Fosamax was right. the name of it, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you got to take that and sit upright and drink a and ton of water And she felt afterwards. terrible for yeah, a couple it, days it's afterwards. it's horrible. Isn't it, it, it affects the immune system, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I was, uh, well, I don't know the exact uh, mechanism, okay. but because I don't, it's not my specialty. Sure. But either way, resistance training showed that bone mineral density actually goes up, um, whereas with aerobic, it actually goes down. And you guys know all this stuff with aerobic. Um uh, so first of all, I'm a cardiologist. <laughs> my patients, and like when I give these lectures, like I teach doctors how to teach their patients to lose weight. Like my number one requested talk is, hey doc, you know, we want to fly you out to Arizona. Uh, you know, we need, we want your weight loss lecture. And these are CMEs. These are continuing medical education conferences where doctors want to learn about weight loss. Mm -hmm. So they call me in. Um, so that's the, the, the main talk I give is usually about weight loss to doctors so that they can teach their patients uh, how to lose weight. Um, so I forgot where I was going. Oh, about the, about resistance training. Oh yeah. So I, resistance. So yeah. So I'm giving this talk and, and I, and I'm tall. I've been doing this for like 20 years, almost telling, telling doctors, listen, um, cardio is good for you. You know, there is, there's no doubt cardio is good for your heart. Endurance, cardiovascular mortality goes down. There was a study published in the journal of American Coll college of cardiology in 2014 that showed if you run twice a week for just five minutes, at a, and not, not even fast, just like two and a half to maybe three and a half miles an hour, like a light jog, or, or it's even just walking if you're taller. Um, for five minutes, you reduce your cardiovascular mortality by 45%. If you did it every day of the week, it would be 50%. And all-cause mortality went down 29%. Um, so it's good for you. Cardiovascularly, cardio is good for you. It's just not efficient for weight loss. It, it is... You're, and and they, have, they have found that there's this thing called the constrained... Uh, model um, for for activity. They found that people. They, they found that you, there's a cap to how many calories you can actually burn with activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if, if if you run a mile, let's say you burn 200 calories, depending on how how much you weigh. Running an additional mile, you might burn another two. You know, make it 220, then another mile 240, and then it kind of caps out. Your body starts taking energy from your knee and other places. So that we, that is not. It's not linear. Like you can't just keep running all day and burn 18,000 calories. It just doesn't work that way. Your body just doesn't do it. It adapts and says, listen, this is insane. We're not going to burn any more calories. Mm -hmm. So there's a constrained model to activity now. We know we know this for sure. Tons of studies on it. I think I sent you a link to all the, yeah, yeah, you the did. studies. The constrained model says that you, the more activity you do, uh, there is a cap to the amount of calories you can burn. So you you can only burn so many calories. They like I like I give my patient like when I'm giving this talk, I give the, the doctors or a patient an, an example. A two hundred pound person, uh, if they ran for three miles, they would burn maybe three hundred calories, right? If they lifted weights, squats, deadlifts, you know, big compound movements, they lifted weights for an hour, hour and a half, they might burn 150, 200 calories too. Uh, or how long would it take you to run three miles, like a 5K? An hour? Yeah. For most of my patients, right. like 40 minutes to an sure. hour. You could not eat the plain bagel with cheese. That's 320 calories. That's way more efficient. That costs zero seconds. Mm -hmm. Like literally, I just don't put it in my mouth. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's zero seconds. Right. Whereas I, I run for an hour or lift weights for an hour and a half to try to even come close to the calories in the plain bagel with cheese. Um, so I think the, the point of all this is like I'm a cardiologist. I'm not telling you guys – 
don't do cardio like this mm-hmm. you know my patients need to do cardio and i try to transition them over into lifting weights once they're like you know their endurance has come up um but my biggest issue is like if you actually lifted weights kind of like you know in your book I, you know i read the whole thing in your book if you, you you outline this clearly if you lift weights and put on just a little bit of muscle like even just five pounds in a year um your metabolism goes up by a lot like you know the studies show anywhere from like six to eight calories maybe 60 calories of per pound of ga- muscle gained we don't know there's not really like a really good way uh to measure that so so your your metabolism goes up you're burning more energy doing everyday stuff even while you sleep mm. your body needs more calories if you were ma- maintaining on 1800 calories a day and now uh you put on five pounds of muscle now maybe you can eat 2100 or 2200 mm. and still uh maintain your weight they they also have found that um with that same that constrained model of exercise people who are less active or sedentary they actually burn more calories if they start an exercise program like if somebody just sits around all day suddenly they start moving people at at lower levels of activity you do burn calories people who are already quite active if they increase their activity they're not going to burn that many more calories that's like that whole constraint model like it's not linear where the more activity you do the more calories you burn Mm -hmm. if you don't do very much activity and you start doing more it goes up and then it kind of like plateaus well this is why like adam when he was competing he would and he would coach competitors you know these people going on stage trying to install their experts at getting shredded he would save the cardio for the end end. to get that boost because eventually it kind of tops out and Mm -hmm. you start to adapt right yeah and that's yeah i did that too like i didn't compete but i got down like seven percent body fat something but that's what i did i did zero cardio Mm. till like the very end add a little bit and it's not like insane cardio because you don't want to even lose muscle like they found um with excessive intense cardio and you guys already know this you talk about it every day Mm. but excessive cardio uh eats up muscle like you know you always say it pairs down muscle absolutely true your muscle mass your lean body mass goes down and then if you still have fat on you your your body fat percentage goes up that's not something most people want. Now, when you're lecturing and, and doing this in front of all these physicians, like, is it well received? Because I, there's not a lot of doctors I hear like really emphasizing the need for resistance training. Well, you can't argue with studies. Like, yeah. they're all scientists, like me. Sure. Uh, if it, if the research doesn't prove it, they would be like, okay, dude, you're insane. Um, but they, I present it like you know, study by study. Like, listen, here's. Everything we know, I have like a two hour lecture on YouTube on everything we know about exercise. It goes through every single study. It's boring as hell, but doctors <laughs> like this stuff. <laughs> Sal you you yeah. might, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah you People guys, like us yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. You guys would probably like it. But, but I go through like every single study on exercise and what it does and what we know about it and, you know, how it works and mm-hmm. how you can use it to benefit yourself. And then there's another one like that that's two hours on every study we've, that we've ever done on diet. Obviously, not the stupid studies that make no difference. Like, you know, there's, a, there's like a billion studies on diet and exercise but the ones that uh kind of shape what we know about exercise and diet uh today um are very important so yeah so it is well received because you can't really argue with you know we we made people exercise for two whole years and they lost three kilograms Mm -hmm. two years of exercise and they lost three kilograms that's not efficient weight loss Uh, they could have lost three kilograms in two weeks if you just cut your calories three kilograms is six maybe eight pounds pounds at the most right uh in two years that's bad like Mm. my patients who weigh 300 pounds if they lost three kilograms good but that's horrible. Now, like, what you, a, you need to be, you need to weigh a hundred something. Now, what about the studies that have shown that excessive exercise actually increases risk? Uh, of, so there are you you mentioned some of them. There's mm-hmm. one study that showed your calcium uh, score. There, there's a scan we did. The Dr. Agaston, who's a cardiologist in Miami, he's actually the doctor that wrote the South Beach Diet. Book. That's, that's right. Dr. Oh, yeah. Agaston's a cardiologist who invented the heart scan. It's the CT scan of your chest. It looks at your calcium score. The more calcium you have in your heart the more likely you are to have cardiovascular disease. There's a correlation there. So people who ran uh, at an excessive amount, like they did an excessive cardio, and I think it was seven miles an hour more than four times a week, something like that, really excessive. Um, fast pace, lots of running, lots of mileage. You know, like, like a guy training for a marathon or a gal training for a marathon, their calcium scores went up. Um, there was also another study, um, Mayo Clinic Proceedings published this one, that... Um, you, if people like ran a little bit, they would they would their their longevity increases. But once it hit a certain threshold, and I don't remember the exact number, but once it hit a certain threshold, um, your your chance of dying went up. Your mortality goes up after a certain point. I don't remember the exact cutoff in that one, but you 
And that's why like, I, I, I want people to have a balanced approach. Yeah, you need some endurance, and it actually help you lift better. I mean, I'm sure you guys have noticed yeah. this. Yep. When a patient's just, or clients are just lifting weights, they do really well. Throw in like one day of cardio here and there, just get their endurance up, suddenly they can do more reps or that's more right. weight. I mean, that's I've seen that all the time. Um, so there is some of that. There is some crossover, but definitely if you're trying to build muscle and lose fat, you definitely don't want to be like running marathons. I mean, you guys see the pictures of people that win marathons. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, they don't look anything it like It sounds like based off what you said, a, a good strategy might be uh, run a mile twice a, a, a week. Because you're saying five minutes, you said five minutes of of cardio. Five minutes, not even running. It, oh, it was running. literally like two and a half miles per hour to three. Oh, and a that's half. oh like, wow, that's like a power. Walk. That's like you walking yeah. a walk totally. if you're tall or like a light jog. Yeah, I walk. Like I me. walk at a three. I I walk on the treadmill a three five to a four. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you would be a walk for you, but for people wow. my height, it would probably be slight. Well, three point five is not, but it would be yeah, basically a faster walk. Wow. wow, interesting. Now, what about insulin resistance? I know, and I, I, I talk about some of this in the book, and, and there was a study, I didn't quote in the book, that showed that just building muscle, regardless of, of, of body weight, improves uh, your sensitivity to insulin. Like, How important is your body's ability to utilize insulin effectively in terms of cardiovascular health? Yeah, it's it's definitely huge. The more muscle you have, the more you the insulin resistance gets better. And and in fact, like diabetic doctors, endocrinologists will tell their patients, if you ate a little bit more carbs than you should, and you don't want to increase your insulin, you know, shots afterwards, just do like a minute of squats because mm. just getting the blood flowing to those muscles um, releases factors that make that, that make it so you can handle that extra sugar load better. But yeah, definitely having more muscle is very. Uh, protective against uh, diabetes, and when it comes to testosterone, um, you know they've they've done studies where uh, they've given people exogenous, you know, injectable testosterone that didn't have bad low testosterone. I know you, you talk about testosterone all the time. It actually has protective cardio. We'll get into that, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I love that. But that. but definitely, um, when they inject the testosterone in the people, when their body fat would go down, their muscle mass would go up, their insulin resistance improved significantly. Um, Testosterone, uh, I'm sure your audience wants to hear about it, yeah. but I, I talked about this on another um, podcast, but testosterone has like a U-shaped curve. We found that people with testosterone under 200, their cardiovascular mortality goes up. And some of the worst cardiovascular patients have the lowest testosterone. Like people with CHF or congestive heart failure, their testosterone levels are usually low. Really bad diabetics, testosterone levels really low. People with uh, coronary artery disease, testosterones are really low. They've actually found that testosterone dilates your arteries, your coronary arteries. They put people on a treadmill, make them run or walk, you know, whatever it is, for as long as they could. And they they, they time them to see when they start getting the, the chest pain or the, you know, ischemia, um, where your, your blood flow, your oxygen demand and supply don't match. You get you start getting squeezing chest pain. And then they'd give them testosterone, put them on it for a few weeks, and bring them back and have them do it again. Their arteries are more dilated, and, and oh, wow. they they actually can go farther. Hmm. Um, in one of the studies, it was only like 26 seconds more, but on this Bruce protocol on an incline, 26 seconds is huge. Hmm. Um, in another study, it was like an additional um, two minutes where they could actually go further before they got the Just squeezing. from the testosterone. Yeah. Wow. Um, but they've also found that people, so so at really low testosterone, the cardiovascular mortality is higher. And then as it normalizes, you're in the four, five, six hundred, maybe eight, nine hundred range. It, it It's like your cardiovascular mortality is normal you know, compared to normal populations. But then as testosterone goes up again, like, you know, you got these bodybuilders injecting whopping doses, a gram a day, two grams, whatever, or per week, I mean, um, their cardiovascular mortality went up. But there are studies that showed there was no... Uh, if people were on therapeutic level TRT, like not these one gram a week type right. people, but like 200, maybe yeah. 300 at the most a week or every other week, whichever, um, there was no additional uh, uh, cardiovascular risk. The, the problem with testosterone when you get too much of it is it aromatizes into estradiol, um, which is a female hormone, and those um, – have been shown to increase clotting and you know those kind of things that cause some of the strokes and heart attacks that we see hmm. um, with testosterone. But at normal levels or at therapeutic, like like they they have hundreds of thousands of people on testosterone. Most of my patients that are older are are on it. There was no additional. They've looked at you know populations of hundreds of thousands. There was people on TRT and people not on it, and we're talking like normal doses. Obviously, mm -hmm. there was no. Uh, 
a worsening uh, cardiovascular risk. And in some cases, there was improvement. Like they were less likely to have their, their CHF uh, classification got better. Um, they had less symptoms, less hospitalizations, uh, the ischemic conditioning where they can actually do more before the chest pain starts got better. So there are, there is, a, there were some trends towards improvement. Um, their body fat went down, obviously their, their muscle size, lean body mass went up. I mean, we're not, these patients are not bodybuilders, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but still, even with just small, you know, therapeutic doses, they improved in a lot of categories. Was there any studies to like with growth hormone? I know that's sort of like the so, fountain of youth for people that they, I've, I've seen a trend there in terms of so that and how that affects the heart. Growth hormone got popular a while, you know, like maybe 10, 15 years ago, maybe more than that, but it hasn't really shown anything in terms of heart disease. And even bodybuilders don't really use it anymore because it has so many you know, you get that weird gut, you know, right, thing and turtle get, shell. Yeah, yeah, you get all kinds of weird stuff with it. So I didn't, I didn't see anything about yeah, that. Yeah, I know it can affect yeah. insulin. Uh, you can actually develop insulin resistance uh, from, you know. Because you get all that abdominal. Or just too much growth hormone. I know it opposes, right? If you Well, there's also a massive difference between what bodybuilders take and sure. what, like, yeah. if you go yeah. see, like, a specialist yeah. that puts you on it. Like, They're taking a lot of things. Yeah, yeah I know. My, they had my mother-in-law, and, like, like a, the dose was, like, so tiny compared to, like, what – you know, a bodybuilder is taking well, yeah. 10x. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. but back to the testosterone, because that's mm -hmm. very fascinating because it's, and it's extremely, I, you know, I tell people this, it's a very safe hormone. Like if you had to inject yourself with a very high dose of a hormone, it's one of, and you're a man, testosterone is probably one of the safer ones, it's probably not going to kill you. Whereas you did that with insulin or other hormones, oh, yeah. you'd have some big problems. Well, insulin, you can crash your blood sugar and you, you could technically die. From right, it. right. Yeah, taking a whopping dose of testosterone, I mean, bodybuilders do it all the time. Nothing, nothing bad. I mean, there are there have been some who've had heart attacks and strokes mm -hmm. and died even, but you we can't say with absolute certainty that that was why. They're probably engaging in other high risk behavior too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I know it, it, you talked about the widening of the of the blood vessels, so it's got some of those uh, those yeah those the vasodilation is dilating huge. effects. And, and now along those lines, are there uh, any any because I mean we read about supplements that supposedly help with. You know, vasodilation or supplements you take before you you work out and you get a pump. And I I even read some studies on citrulline and how it might lower blood pressure a little bit because of some of that. Are there any supplements that you know of that help with some of that stuff? So nitroglycerin works. We give mm -hmm. that to patients in a yeah. prescription form. When when somebody we know that they've had a heart attack and have stents or whatever it is, we know they have blocked arteries. They say I, I walk halfway around the block, I start getting that, I pop a nitro, opens up, I can keep going. We know that works. Um, so the nitrous type stuff definitely works. I know mm -hmm. it's supposedly in some supplements. The problem with supplements, you don't know what's actually in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're buying a bottle of something yeah. and it says it has all this stuff in it. It's really not FDA regulated. There are third parties that test it and you could you can always look for that um, to make sure. But I remember there, there was a study done on at, at uh, Target, Walgreens, CVS, oh, I saw this one. Vitamin uh, yeah. Shop, yeah. It was terrible. all the supplements. 95% of them did not contain one lick of what they said they yeah. contained. Just heavy you, metals. Yeah. Not, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But they contained almost nothing. Like you're you're buying a vitamin B12 and even something benign like B12 or B6 or whatever. Yeah, sugar doesn't pills. even have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw these this a study on gas station like libido pills. Yeah. And, they, and like a majority of them contained the, the normal gummy bears. Like, no, no. A majority like of them Viagra, contained like right? Viagra yeah. or, you know, the active oh. ingredients that are in. Yeah. And uh, you, they're good. like sneaking in some of these drugs in there and you're like, man, these you know gas station well, they, motor pills really work. To, they <laughs> yeah. used to do that with like dihydrotestosterone or like the uh, DHEA and, yeah. and all that. Uh, they they had like you know the stuff Mark McGuire was taking. Oh yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, believe me, I did my share of that. I mean, back <laughs> in the would, day, but it wasn't illegal. Like you know, at that time, you could buy these stacks, animal stack, and whatever. Oh, I remember. I used to take. Uh, there was one that was uh, methyl master drawl. I think was the name of it. Super drawl was Mast. another one. And I remember I it were over the Sounds counter. Legit. You take them and they work. <laughs> yeah. You're like, whoa. Later on, I did some research and I found that they were actually anabolic steroids that pharmaceutical companies uh, dumped in like the 60s. SARMs? No, they weren't even SARMs. They were, they were actual they were steroids. steroids. Okay. But they, these pharmaceutical companies dumped them because of the side effects. Yeah. But because of the way the laws were written, they kind of were gray market. Let's, so you could sell let's them the talk stuff. a little bit about SARMs. What, Doc, what's your thoughts on what, what you're seeing? I mean, that's exploding so right now. The, the problem is they were... They're... Uh, 
the problem is we we don't know a lot. Like if you're gonna do something shady and not really legal, like why not just take testosterone, yeah. right? Yeah. Or like something like Anavar or, or you know any of the stuff that we actually know works and is safe and is not going to kill you. Some of these things, the reason they abandon them now, people go up and look up these old patents on this stuff and they're like, oh, you know, uh, a receptor modulator. Let me you know steroid androgen set receptor modulators for people who don't know what that is, but. Mm -hmm. Um, let's look. Let's try to make this and see what happens. Like there's the reason. There's a reason why it was dumped. Like <laughs> yeah. there's a reason why they're like, hey, this is a really bad idea. Like let's not pursue this patent and make billions. Like if it worked and it was safe, they'd be making billions, right? I mean, right. That, that's mm -hmm. kind of how it works. They dumped it for a reason because you know they didn't want to take the risk of you getting cancer in your in your stomach or whatever it might be. And then people like recreate this stuff because they find the formula. And it's, you know, if we took uh, pseudoephedrine and we flipped it one way, you know, it's kind of like how they make certain other drugs. But like you know, why would you take this when it could be? insanely dangerous when you could actually take something that we already know works and really works, and well. works better <laughs> yeah it's better it's actually what they're trying to emulate yeah they're trying to create something that works like testosterone but it's not testosterone like just take testosterone right right mm -hmm. like it would be better and safer now along the lines of things that work um let's talk about aspirin for a second it's been around forever um lots of studies show that in, in some people it's, a, it's taking a little bit is yeah. very beneficial for preventing heart attack and stroke do you is this something that you do you recommend to your patients sometimes? yeah so the isis 2 trial um they looked at aspirin and it was it gave you an eighty percent reduction. Now there's almost no drug that's crazy we've yeah. ever in, like discovered that gives you an eighty percent reduction. Hmm. It's like ten percent, twelve, maybe twenty, and some of the you know better stuff, but an eighty percent reduction uh, in preventing heart attacks and strokes. Um, so most of my patients they've already had a heart attack or stroke, uh, hmm. and they have to be on it regardless. Because if you've had a, a stent put in or a stroke, or whatever, you have to be on aspirin. I mean, it's insane not to. Mm. You're just asking to die. Um, so those people have to be on it. But like a normal person, like, you know, young and healthy, the, there's no evidence that shows you should be on these things. Now, if you're like above 50, diabetic, hypertensive, cholesterol through the roof, smoker, you have every risk factor, you really should be on it. Yeah. Um, there's a score where we plug in your age, height, wage, sex, all the conditions you have, and it spits out, it's called the Framingham Risk Score. It spits out your cardiovascular disease risk. Anybody over 7.5%, it's like the, the risk of you getting a heart attack or stroke over the next 10 years, or heart attack, um, is 7.5% or more. You should be on a statin, and you should already be on uh, aspirin. So definitely make sure that you are. But like a normal young person that's pretty healthy and fit, doesn't smoke, Not has really no right. risk factors, there's really no. Yeah. Why do we see uh, more cases of heart disease and heart attack in men uh, than in women? I mean, it's the number one killer of both men it's and women. It's almost even. It is. Uh, it, there's about 630,000 people every year that die of heart attacks and heart attacks, let's just put it, heart disease. Half are men, half are women. It's like 52 to 48. Okay. 52% hmm. men, 48% women. So then it's a myth that, that men suffer from it more. They used to, um, but then uh, women caught up. <laughs> they started. Smoking. Do you think that smoking. I say smoking has yeah. probably? Uh, I was probably that right. Yeah, it was smoking. Yeah. Women have a protective effect that because of their hormones, the estrogen. Once they pass menopause, though, they're equal. Um, once they're like, you know, they're not creating hormones anymore, but they have like a ten-year delay. Like men at fifty-five is about when they start having all these issues, and men, women are like sixty-five. Mm -hmm. But once they're past menopause, by about 10, 15 years or so, they kind of catch up. But because women started smoking. Um, that kind of caught them up, but right now it's almost even. It's fifty-two to forty-eight. Wow. Do Do you ever get the, a, a patient that just that just boggles you, where they, they for whatever reason their numbers look like they should be this way, but they're totally fine, or maybe the opposite, where you, somebody gets a heart attack and you're you're doing the traditional test and you can't figure out why or or what's going on. Does that ever happen? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the, the issue is here's a, here's I know what you're asking. Yeah. And, and uh, the the, the I, I tell medical students this all the time. I'm like, listen, all the patients that we've seen, they're all smokers. 95% mm. of my patients had a heart attack and have stents now or have heart failure or whatever it is because they smoked. Wow. Like, no doubt about it. Like, That's there was why this, it's there, the top 10, right? There was this, <laughs> one, two, three. Yeah, all, yeah. There was this lady who was 39 wow. years old, and she had a heart attack, you know, a big one. Like, you know, put a stent in her LAD. Like, that's mm. usually, it's called the widow maker, that, that artery, because people usually die. They don't anymore, you know, but back in the old days when we didn't have good treatments, they did. Um, 39 years old, you know, beautiful, healthy, fit, CrossFits, whatever. 
And my students were like, oh, how did she have a heart attack? I was like, I bet you she smoked. Like, oh, she, she said she doesn't smoke. I was like, okay, let me go ask. So I walk in there like, hey, you know, I started talking to her, ask her all the bit. I was like, hey, do you do you smoke or did you ever smoke? She's like, no. I was like, you never smoked before? She's like, well, when I was a kid. And then like she starts telling the story. She smoked for like 10, 15 years. Wow. Back when she was like in college. So it always comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they're not a smoker now, or they don't think they used to smoke. Well, we smoked for a few years on and off, but that stuff adds up. Um, but there are people, the other percentage of people that I see because they've had a heart attack or stroke is usually the ones with like really high genetic uh, cholesterol. If they're also smokers, that's obviously even oh, worse. Wow. Um, but those are the people with the cholesterols of like four or 500. Now, when we talk about smoking, where, do, where does, okay, cigarettes... Vaping, marijuana. Yeah. How, how do that? How do those yeah, all line like tobacco? What's pipe? Adam's? What's Adam's and, risk yeah. right and now? Who, and <laughs> where can we wiggle? What kind yeah, of life hookah, insurance should we get hookah, on? Hookah. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Give me so give the, the cigars. Big, so let's start with tobacco smoke. Yeah. So the the problem with smoking is the volume of smoke and all the other chemicals. The other four thousand chemicals lead to cancers and other stuff, but. When you smoke, it like like if you were just taking nicotine, mm -hmm. it does constrict your arteries a little, um, sort of like caffeine does, but it's not like going to kill you. You know, if you're sucking on lozenges or gum or patches or whatever. Um, but it's the smoke. Once the smoke gets into your lungs, it causes um, <clears throat> reactions and inflammation and stuff that starts to destroy your arteries. Um, so it's actually the smoke that causes. So people who smoke hookah are like, well, you know, I don't smoke cigarettes. You know, cigarettes are bad for you. No, well, the volume of smoke in like one puff of hookah can be equivalent to like 50 puffs of smoke on a cigarette. Mm, wow. Yeah, or 100. You know, they, it, the studies are a little, they vary depending on how big your breath is, I suppose, or how long you draw it in for. Um, marijuana, very similar. You're, in, you're inhaling a ton of smoke into your lungs. I bet if we took your lungs out, hopefully never, but if we did, you would have a lot of the same changes that people who smoke cigarettes. Now, it's obviously not as bad yeah. because cigarettes, for whatever reason, contain chemicals upon chemicals upon chemicals, and that's why we've, you know, we've tried so hard to, to ban advertising and, you know, they sued the companies mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but definitely, it's the smoke that actually causes uh, all the problems. And then how, how, you know, does the body naturally start to repair that? Like, say somebody is a... You know, day. You know, they, they smoke every day, and then they reduce that or eliminate that. Like, how quick does the body heal or the lungs heal? So they say after five years, your risk goes back to like eighty percent of normal. I've I've not found that to be the case. I mean, wow. I've had patients that smoked twenty years ago. I haven't smoked since then. They're like fifty now, or you know, sixty five, whatever. They have a heart attack now. Um, so it's not perfect, but also don't forget my population of patients is biased. Uh, they're seeing right. me because they had that. Right, so right. there is a bias there. It may be that that's true, mm. but if you're seeing me, it's because you've had this problem. There's like a selection mm -hmm. bias. Um, so I've seen patients who quit smoking many, many years ago who are now having heart attacks and strokes, but they say after quitting, after about five years, your risk kind of goes back to close to normal. I, I would imagine too, I mean, you're saying that the volume of smoke is really what matters the most. And so let's, you know, take somebody who has a cigarette or two or three cigarettes in a day, and then you take someone like me who's like, mm, every other day I, you know, puff on a joint that I take about three to four hits before I go to bed, right? So the volume of smoke that I've been taking in comparison to that is not only am I taking in something But also you're not taking the chemicals. Right. Uh, the, then the nicotine. And the nicotine itself does constrict your arteries, and that, that's a that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's not just, the, I mean, it is mostly the smoke and all the stuff that's in it because there's a lot of stuff in it. Mm -hmm. But a uh, a joint I'd have to look at, but I, yeah. if it's just pure marijuana, um, it's obviously not as dangerous as, as cigarettes. I'll have to look at those. Yeah, studies. from what I've seen with the, with cannabis, because the Cause big it also thing, has a, a, a the CBD has somewhat of a protective for effect. cancer. It, all the cannabinoids. So the, the big ones were the big issue was does it cause cancer? And then they couldn't prove that it caused cancer. In some cases, there might even be a sm small protective effect. That's because the cannabinoids were were anti cancer. So that's the chemicals that are in the marijuana smoke. Uh, as far as heart stuff is concerned, studies do show that it does increase uh, heart attack risk. But it's interesting because ca uh, cannabinoids are vasodilating. That's why your 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 blood pressure drops a little bit, and then your heart beats faster yeah, to make to up make the difference up, right? mm -hmm. versus what you would get from cigarette smoke. But it's not like a like a zero risk. You know, I bet cigarettes have to be the worst, right? Cigarettes by far are the worst, yeah. and a lot of people smoke cigars, but they 
don't get it, you know, oh, keep yeah, it in their mouth puff. and that that and, helps lower the risk. And then what about this, I mean, this the, the uh, vape pens that are going crazy? So right? the vape, it kind of depends. If it has the formaldehyde and all that crazy stuff in it, it's obviously not good for you. The word formaldehyde is bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's like saying sulfuric acid. I mean, it's horrible. Um, but if it's water vapor and whatnot, it's like chewing nicotine. But, you know, they have something called vape lung. Um, or, or popcorn I lung. I read about this. It's called popcorn lung or vape lung. It, your your lungs change in a way based on whatever chemicals are in the vape pen you use. It destroys your lungs in a different way. Mm. may not cause heart disease like heart attacks and strokes, but it definitely has a lot of you know bad mm. effects. Um, yeah. so I, I just remembered a, a study that I wanted to bring up with you. I just remembered it. There, there was a study that I read or maybe a couple that showed that, uh, when, that older people, older populations with higher cholesterol actually – uh, lived longer. Um, are you familiar with? So this that's the obesity paradox. We, okay, we yes. talk about that um, in in a lot in medicine. The obesity paradox says that older people, especially men over sixty five, if they're a little bit overweight, um, they seem to live longer. Mm. So that's where they started doing these fitness versus fatness studies to see like. Can can it this be true? Like an overweight person, uh, just because they're old, they live longer. Um, and they found that it still has nothing to do with the actual weight. Um, if they're fitter, even if they're obese, they, their oh. mortality is similar. Um, I know that doesn't directly answer your question. Cholesterol, they used to think that, you know, if, if we've been controlling your cholesterol for the last 50 or 60 years, and, and now you're 70 or 60, and we take you off some of your meds, that you'll do better. And, th and that is true. Like there are a lot of patients, you know, they're like, like I have some 80 and 90 year olds now. They're like, doc, I just don't want to be on 30 pills. Imagine if you were putting 30 chemicals into your body every day and suddenly we eliminate some of them. Sure. You're going to feel better unless like some of them are like for high blood pressure and stuff that's like really going to kill you. But if your cholesterol bumps up a little at this point, you know, you're not going to, at this point, your mortality is probably pretty well defined. You know, if you're 92, okay. you're, are you really going to live to 180? Um, no, but you know, if we start removing some of these things, um, especially beta blockers, like, you know, it makes you feel fatigued and tired. If we start removing some of these, things, and a lot of patients are like demented, but then you look at it's cause their blood pressure is so low. Take off, you know, they're, they're acting, oh, wow. weird. take off some of their blood pressure meds. They're hmm. suddenly getting perfusion to their brain and they're no longer low. And they are like, Oh, we cured his dementia. Wow. Um, so you, you, with the elderly population, that's why there's geriatric medicine. You got to be hmm. careful if you start removing, uh, some of these medications, and you worked with the elderly a lot. Mm -hmm. If you'd start removing some of these medications, not to where their pressure is like dangerously high again, but or or their other numbers like you know diabetes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But when you start eliminating some things, they feel better. They're more energetic. Mm -hmm. They might have been fatigued, tired, depressed because of beta blockers, and now they like have energy, um, all those kind of things. So they actually feel a lot a lot better. Um, that also contributes to your longevity and health. I would also imagine that there's, there might be a little bit like under being underweight when you're older, that can mean a lot of bad things. Being underweight at, at any age is not good for you. Right, That's why we have the BMI, the, the body mass index below 18.5 and above 30. The, like th they use 30 as a cutoff because that's when mortality or morbidity starts to affect you. Like 30 is not an arbitrary number. Like if your BMI is over 30 and I get it, bodybuilders don't harass me. I know how it works. Yeah. But if your BMI is over 30 and you're a normal person, you're not like muscular and a football player, you know, whatever. Sure. If your BMI is over 30, which is 95% of the population, but if your BMI is over 30, mortality stuff starts to happen. Cholesterol, diabetes, you know, uh, um, heart disease, all that stuff, you know, strokes, whatever, all starts to go up. Um, and the more over, you know, 30, the worse. Um, so, the, so that's where. And then not, also under 18. And then under 18. That's, but those people are like the bulimics and the anorexics. Yeah. And those people have serious, serious health issues. I mean, like oh, they, it's literally deadly. I mean, that's why those, those eating disorders, I'm sure we've all seen tons of those, those type of eating disorders, uh, anorexia and bulimia, um, impart a huge, huge risk because, you know, it's psychological and, and, and they, they go vomit or they're like, you know, binge eating sometimes and then go throw up or they don't want to eat in front of people. They eat like a piece of lettuce and then go eat a whole cake. Like that kind of behavior is, is not conducive to living a long, healthy and life. And also the nutrient deficiencies that they tend to, sure. you know, come. Just know. like people with gastric bypass. Yeah. When they first get gastric bypass, they're not absorbing anything. They have this short gut syndrome. They have to take all these extra vitamins and minerals to like at least 
keep the stuff that they have because mm. they're not. Let's talk really about eat. that. Where do you where do you stand on that? You get a client that comes and sees you, and they're you know morbidly obese. Um, are are you pro that surgery, or are you trying to get them to do it through their lifestyle first? Like, how, what are your thoughts? So the way they do it, the, the gastric surgeons don't just throw them into surgery. They have them go through psychological counseling. They have them uh, try a diet. They they want to make them lose five to ten percent of their weight on their own first. They usually send them to me to clear them for surgery. Like you got to see cardiologists to say that you're not going to die during surgery. So they come to, to see me. We run a few cardiac tests on them. Now, if they're like 30 years old and pretty healthy, there's not a whole lot you need to do. Like, mm -hmm. okay, can you walk upstairs without being short of breath or whatever? Okay, sure, you're going to be a little short of breath because you're 400 pounds, but like you're not like huffing and puffing like you're going to die. But anyways, I clear them for surgery. But it's not like a surgeon just says, okay, let's just slice you open and take out half your stomach. Um, or 90% of your stomach. but So they send them to me usually to get them cleared. But the uh, um, they they make them try to lose weight by calorie restriction for like six months. It's like a process. You got to go see the psychologist. Yeah. Then you got to go see this person, then that person, then this person. And, and in the meantime, those six months, they're restricting calories and trying to lose weight on their own. So it's not like they just throw them to me and say, hey, you know, here's a patient. Yeah, they, they do they do that now. They put a lot of rules. And still, though, the fail rate still is uh, – because, you're, well, again, you're dealing with some yeah, really so hard I, behavior. So I guess my, my question, though, is that, you know, are are you a, a fan of it? I mean, are you pro – I mean, if it's going to save your life right. and you are morbidly obese and yeah. you, you've tried everything else, you have to do it. Like, yeah. this is literally life-saving. Yeah. Um, if you've not really tried and you just want to – like, this is like a cosmetic and you think it's fun – which I don't know too many people that do, but if you're just doing it just to do it or everyone's telling you to do it and you've not really tried anything else, you really shouldn't. You you should try the other stuff. But there's almost no gastric surgeon now that would, you show up in his office at 400 pounds, all right, surgery tomorrow. Like that just doesn't happen. It's not even legal. Like how how have you ever have you thought about or I don't know if you do this because in the past, um, you know, I, at one point, like I've said before, I trained a lot of doctors and then they started to send me their patients, um, you know, a few of my, a few of the doctors I trained were vascular surgeons and their patients, very similar to yours, like all smoked. They all had issues with their cardiovascular health. And then they started to send me some of their patients and we actually had good success because of the daily and weekly coaching. You know, it was like, I was with them doing stuff. Have you ever worked with people that you could say, okay, look, here's a deal. You need to lose weight. Uh, it's really hard to do on your own. I can tell you what to do, but then you're gone on your own. Here's some people that you might want to work with. Yeah, so I usually have them work with a registered dietitian, and I'll send, I'll give them references of personal trainers. Like, oh, yeah. listen, you, if you're serious, here's two people you need to talk to. And at the end of my talks, if I'm like in Chicago, because I used to live there, I know some personal trainers there and, and like some registered dietitians. I'll give them at like my last slide would be, here's the name of this person and here's the name of this person. Go talk to these cool. people. Send your patients to them. Because they're all doctors. That and listen to, to Mind Pump. Yeah. Well, oh my God, I've done that a million times. I, mean, I, I run all these nice. fitness groups. I don't know, I was telling Sal the other day. I run a lot of fitness groups on WhatsApp and, you know, the combat stretch. I'm like, okay, got to watch this video. Go to minute four, four, four minutes, 10 seconds. Do this combat stretch before you squat or the 90-90, whichever one it is. And I'll tell them where to go. But yeah, no, I reference your guys' stuff all the time. I'm so glad we have people like you guys. Awesome, thank you. Um, but I, I send them... Uh, your links and your videos, especially the videos, because it's like a visual demonstration. It's like yeah. here's exactly like the active plank thing. That yeah. You try to, well, I could plank for 50 minutes. Like yeah. that's not actually what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I could do it for eight hours probably, but that's not the like you're not really working out your right, abs right. or core. You need to be doing it this way, where it's actually like you know hard, or like the 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 uh, physio ball uh, crunch. Crunch. Yeah, nobody does those right. Like. Yeah. You know, or like, you know, I want to do something for my abs. Well, here's something, you know, like that looks easy. Like, just try it. Trust me. Right. You're not going to be able to do more than like eight or nine without, you know, feeling like you want to vomit. <laughs> do you remember, Doc, what uh, what attracted you to the show? Like, do you remember the you first episode? I was, was on it? some fitness group on Facebook and somebody's like, any good fitness podcast? And then people listed a bunch and I, and one of them was my pump. I added all the other ones on. I was like, oh, they're not that good. And then, I, and then, then I'd listen to you. I was like, oh, like this is different. This is really, really good. Right. Like you guys talk for like forty minutes, but recently 50, <laughs> 55, 57. But it was like, okay. Sometimes I would fast forward. Yeah, we stretch. I'll, 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 I'll tell the truth. Yeah. In the beginning, I did at least because I, I was like, you getting, want the fitness. I was getting into fitness, and I wanted the fitness. Like, yeah, the stories are awesome. And now I know you guys personally. Like, I know he has a dog, and you know Jessica, Katrina, and yeah. and you know he has older children. Yeah. You have some older ones, yeah, and a yeah. new one, and you guys both. 
have new younger ones. Like, I know your guys' life stories. I feel like I know you. Like, my patients tell me that. They're like, Doc, I watch you on YouTube. You're like my friend. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, great. <laughs> Which is good. Like, it, people feel like they can relate to you. Um, so I, I wouldn't stop doing that. It's great. But in the beginning, I would fast forward to the fitness. I'm like, oh, my God, this is exactly what I've been doing. Like, like I, I had my own fitness journey. And um, I've always been fit because I played sports and I worked out as a kid, but never, like, properly. In 2000. Uh, 18, like I was around 43 maybe or 42. And I, and I, I was like, you know what? I'm like 193 pounds. This is just not right. I, I need to lose some weight. It's like, you know what? I'll do squats and push ups every day. I'll do a hundred a day. The squats were easy. I could do a hundred body weight push ups a day. That was no problem. Started doing the push ups. I could do like 10, 15 in the beginning. And I'll, you know, eventually got up to like 40, 15 in a row, but I, was, I still look the same. So, um, a friend of mine and, and, and some of her friends and my wife, even they hired a fitness trainer. And he would come to our bar, and I got a really nice home gym. And he would train train us there. His name is Matt Longley, good friend of mine. He's a linebacker at uh, Charlotte University now. But he lived in Toledo. Um, but then he moved away, so then I got another fitness trainer. Worked out with them. No, nothing about nutrition whatsoever. Um, and I got more fit. I would, my lifts were getting stronger. Everything got better. No problem. 2000, he moved away too. I don't know why they do this to me. He moved away too. And I'm like, all right, I got to train myself. So I trained myself. And I was like, it's working, but I'm fat still. Like I'm fit, but I'm fat, right? I'm 193 pounds, well, maybe 188. And I was like, you know, I got to, I got to lose weight. This is insane. So I, this is when I started really researching stuff. And I started reading all the stuff online, found you guys, was reading. And I was like, you know, I need a calorie deficit. It's the only way. So I you know, re redid my fitness pal. I'd always been using it, but not religiously, just to track my weight. Put it at fourteen hundred calories. Oh, that's a big. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's a big. Fourteen hundred to fifteen hundred. I lost a ton of weight. I got down to one forty five in, like, in like six or seven months. Wow. By August, I was one forty five, but I was like, I'm shredded and I'm small. I'm tiny though. Like this is this can't be good. And I was I, I was not eating like enough protein. I just ate fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred calories mm -hmm. a day. And I was like, okay, this is good. I weigh less than I did in high school, but this is also not good. Like this is, I look like a, I walked out of a concentration camp or a jail. Like I've been <laughs> malnourished. Mm. It was horrible. So then I was like, you know what? I need to be a fitness trainer. So I, I signed up with the NASM, mm. took the classes and, and did the course. And I became a fitness trainer. But then I hired a person who gets people ready for bodybuilding shows. And he was like, dude, what? on earth did you do like seven months straight of dieting no diet breaks no you know are you tracking protein I'm like no not you know i just eat what whatever adds up to 1500 or 1400 he's like okay that's not gonna work <laughs> so he gave me some tips so i bulked up a little after august got up to like 178 then i stayed around there um still working out by myself the next year january i was like i need this is i need help and i hired another guy who gets people ready for shows um his name was jake he was like, dude, you need to eat protein, you need to do this, whatever. I got down to 163 again, but it was like really shredded, and I had like muscles. It sounds like, okay, this is good. This yeah. is what you got to do. Um, so I was doing, I was doing all, and then I had, and I'd already, I'd bought anabolic at the time. Mm. That was like the first one I got. That was, I don't know, somewhere in there, like in 2019, maybe towards the end. I was doing that. I mean, that, that was that was my work. I mainly compound lifts with a squat rack and a barbell, nothing fancy obviously made huge uh, gains. And I think that's what most people should probably do mm -hmm. um, is start with something that's like three days a week, big, huge compound lifts and just let it be. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I used to train kids because I coach like a lot of sports, a lot of youth sports, soccer, flag football, tackle football, golf, baseball, softball, whatever. So oh, I was wow. having the kids come to my home gym and we trained them and I wasn't doing anything dangerous with them. It was, it was all regular stuff. Uh, but then when I became a fitness trainer, I, I knew like kind of what to focus on and what to, what to have them do. Um, but it was fun and um, I just wanted to make sure I was doing the right stuff. So that's why I wanted to become a personal trainer. Did you, do you see that? Did you see any carryover to your medical profession? Oh my God. Yes. Now when I give my lecture, this is the other thing. Thanks to to you guys and the fitness, I've changed my weight loss lecture a lot. Like I used to, when I, like I used to do all the dumb stuff. All right, I, when I'd give these talks, you know the stuff you guys tell: don't eat after seven p.m. and yeah. you know try not to eat you know simple carbs and and uh, you know you know carbohydrate insulin model of obesity and weight loss. Like like Dr. Taubes, I'm sure you guys mm -hmm. know him. His book, somebody told me to buy it and read it. So I did keto for a while, lost a few pounds. But then I noticed like when people do these you know weird restrictive diets like keto, for example, you lose weight because you've reduced your calories, but then once your calories match your maintenance, you no longer lose weight. 
increase fat. Okay, then you start getting weight again. Or like, okay, you know, all the stuff they tell you doesn't work. Or they work. go off and they rebound, which is usually what happens. Right, and then that's kind of what happened. I was like, like, you know, this is not working anymore. I need to stop. Um, but either way, like I, I used to give some of that stuff in my talks, you know, and, and you can find the research articles to prove that it works. There was tons of research articles in the 90s, late 90s, that showed that the Atkins style or keto style diets worked. And you can find it rolled your cholesterol, it lowered, you know, all that stuff, but it's because of the weight loss. And we found out later that it's not because of the Atkins diet where you're eating lots of protein and almost no carbs. It's actually because of the weight loss in and of itself. Um, there was, there was a, a more recent study done in 2007 when they wanted to kind of dispel all these myths. They took patients and they had them eat an isocaloric diet which was a deficit um and they had they all ate the same amount of protein or like enough protein for them um and it and then they looked at varying the other stuff carbs and fats and they found no difference like they all lost the same exact amount of weight whether they were on a high carb or high fat diet um and all their cardiovascular uh, risk factors went down insulin resistance cholesterol all that stuff all improved regardless and then they did another study where they took they were looking at diet only versus diet plus resistance training and then diet plus aerobic training or diet plus uh combination training you talk about this one all the yeah. time well this might be one of the ones i talk about yeah they found uh diet alone like energy intake alone was what predicted weight loss whether they did aerobic or weights or both none of that stuff affected weight loss as much as the calorie deficit did. So the calorie deficit alone was responsible for all the weight loss. I'm sure there's other studies. I mean, there's yeah. really thousands of them. Um, but that that was huge. Now I've changed my talk to my patients. Like my patients, like I never would sit with them and set up my fitness pal. I'd be like, yeah, try not to eat after 6 p.m. or, sure. you know, avoid simple carbs, which does work, you know, if, if they are in a deficit or that creates a deficit for That's them. That's why it works. Right. That's why it works. But now it's like, hey, you need to eat X amount of calories. And and some of my patients are like, look, doc, I just can't track. I mean, my patients are older. Not that older people are bad with apps. A lot of them can do it. But some of my patients are like, you know, I don't want to track. This sounds crazy. Like, fine. Take your food, like your breakfast plate. If you have two eggs, two pieces of toast, two pieces of bacon, just cut it in half. One egg, one toast, one bacon. Put the rest aside. Wait 20 minutes because it takes 20 minutes for your stomach through your vagal nerve and hormone signaling to tell your brain that it's full. If you're still hungry go back and eat a little bit more. Don't eat the whole thing. Like the whole idea is to eat less. So go eat a little more and then wait again. And just do it that way. Do it visually. And that actually works too. Because they're. No, I was like, if you're eating half the calories you used to eat, you technically should weigh half your body weight that you weigh now. Yeah, I, I would tell clients that it was uh, exercises for fitness uh, and the nutrition is the weight loss, right? And then, and then the other side of the exercise aspect is Yes, the fitness, but also do it in a way where it'll help with the metabolic adaptations that are going to help with the weight loss, right? So you don't want to do something that, that takes away from that. Right. I thought he was going to reference the study that you always reference about you know, the, the- Muscle loss. Yes. Yeah. The ones that did a calorie-restricted diet, cardio only, without resistance training. Oh, versus, yeah. yeah. That's one of the ones I have in my talk, too. If you do a, if you do a diet only or diet plus aerobic, you actually lost a lot of muscle, like nine- nine percent of your lean body mass went down whereas the resistance training group only lost like two percent and then the combined training lost somewhere in between like five point something percent it, it was uh the per the group that did a diet only with aerobic lost the most lean body mass resistance lost a little not not as much and then the combined group lost somewhere in between the two yeah, yeah. that's the one that I, yeah, i'll talk about that one and then in in my experience in some cases you'll build muscle as well but remember lean body mass also counts water and right, stuff right, like right. that so Two percent, one percent, you know. No, could that's be, not big. That's no, it's significant. And then not. when you start like maintaining or bulking back up, you obviously have a better baseline right. and foundation to to go with. Right, right. So that makes a, a huge difference. What's the biggest, uh, I guess, piece of pushback you get from colleagues uh, when you talk about you know weight loss, nutrition, and health, or is it any, or is there any pushback because so the, you're always referencing studies? So. The way I do it, they you can't really argue. I mean, it, it's like uh, I mean the, the biggest, <laughs> the funniest things when they tell me like, dude, you're a cardiologist and you're telling people not to do. Cardiologists. Cardi, <laughs> like, right. like cardio, it's your, your name. Like, yeah. you know, shoot any people. I'm like, I'm not saying don't do cardio. It's very good for you. You can do it. I would love for my patients. If my patients did that, I probably wouldn't have that many patients, mm -hmm. but they don't. And, and, and it's not how you lose weight. Like if you're doing cardio to lose weight, I got a 10 different ways you could do it that are much better. Right. Like, like there are literally millions of ways you can lose weight that includes zero cardio like you don't even have to lift a finger like my patients are like doc i can't even get out of my chair 
Like, how do you expect me to do any activity? Like, like a 400 pound patient who has heart failure, who has swollen legs and all this stuff. How do they get out of a chair? Right. They don't. So like, doc, what can I do? Like, okay, I got an idea. Exercise your hand, not putting food into your mouth. Right. That's a really easy way that costs you zero time. Uh, and you'll actually lose weight if you actually do it. Mm. So that is that costs you zero. They're like, well, doc, isn't it expensive to eat healthy? I'm like, don't eat healthy. Just eat less. <laughs> yeah. That's the like like a lot of patients in some areas are like, well, eating healthy is expensive. Like, don't eat healthy. Eat whatever you're eating now. It just has to be less. Mm. Like, don't give me any excuses. They're like, well, or like patients that smoke or whatever. Like, well, my, my mom died last year and I just went back to smoking. Like, okay. Lots of my patients' moms die and they don't smoke. Like you have to find something else. Don't always make an excuse or have some built-in excuse. Like the biggest problem I have with doctors, and I tell them this in my talks, stop saying diet and exercise. Like we're creating a problem. When you say the only way to lose weight is diet and exercise, like the exercise part nobody does. I was like, raise your hand if you exercise. Like two people raise their hand. I'm like, how did you lose weight? Do you uh, do you exercise or do you just not eat much or are you just overweight? Like, you know, a lot of doctors are overweight. But the point is don't give patients a built-in excuse because when once you say diet and exercise, patients automatically think, I can't lose weight and I, I can't it. exercise. Yeah. No, but they can't exercise. That's what I mean. Or They'll they say, don't. Yeah. Oh, I can't do that, so I'm not doing any of it. Right. And yeah. they have a built-in excuse. Like he, the doctor told me mm -hmm. that if I don't do diet and exercise, I'm not going to lose weight. So cut out the exercise part and tell them just mm -hmm. diet. Well, here's I some, swear to God, you lose weight. Here's if you something. Just diet. Here's something interesting. You might want to might, might want to. But and this depends, of course, on the on the patient. But um, studies will show that when people exercise, they do tend to eat better. Yeah. But they don't show the opposite. If people diet, they tend to not go out and exercise. So I wonder if that strategy might even work as well. Saying, hey, look, I tell you what, just try moving more and exercising. Oh, I tell them to do that. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. they like a lot of people, I'm sure you guys notice when when once they start exercising or sign up with a personal trainer, like, why would I eat like crap if I'm paying all this money to yeah. get healthier? That's it's like, right. you know what, I'm not going to eat a whole pizza, you know, whatever it is. But like when doctors say to patients, the only way to lose weight I is diet say, yeah. and the and part and exercise. Like, no, yeah. you're giving them an excuse, a built in excuse to think they can never lose weight because they can't or won't or don't have the time or drive the kids around or go to soccer practice. They don't have time for the exercise. What? So tell them, listen, don't lift a finger. Do what you normally do. Just don't put more food into your mouth. I swear to God, you will lose weight. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, be, because the success rate is so low and you've been doing this for a while and your approach is better than most cardiologists in terms of talking to people about how to do things. Oh, do I you, have stories for do you. you. I was, well, was going to say, do you ever get like, uh, do, you, do you have any, do you have a positive outlook? Moving oh, forward, I, I or do. Okay. I, I mean, I think. I mean, like, I, I literally have ten copies of the book with me. Mm. I, I have a bunch more at home that I'm giving to people. I brought four that you guys can sign for me. Oh, perfect. <laughs> but either way, um, I like this book. Literally, is exactly what I've been trying to tell people. Okay. And now I can say, listen, there's a book on Amazon called The Resistance Training Revolution. Just read it. I don't care if you do anything. Just go read it. And you know, naturally, when somebody actually reads something and does it, like I'm not just gonna hand it to them because mm -hmm. then they don't want it. Like right. when you give something out for free people won't do it. like like your programs if you handed them out for free i know you have free stuff but if you gave away maps anabolic for free what's the likelihood of someone doing it's not it? as valuable if they pay 100 bucks for it or whatever it is they're more likely to actually look at it and at least read it or watch the videos and actually do it um so i'm not going to just hand it out but if my patients ask me well we don't have any books or any resource i'm like here's a bunch of resources and there's this book you really got to read but I'm, i i think people are starting to realize that look the exercise part is not as important as the diet part. Like, you know, they always say abs are made in the kitchen. Well, everything in terms of weight loss is made yeah. in the kitchen. Like, you don't actually have to exercise. It's great for you. Don't go home, people watching this, and say the cardiologist said, don't exercise. I'm not saying that. I exercise every day. Um, it's very good for you. You will lose, you, you will improve all of your cardiovascular risk factor, but it's not an efficient way to lose weight. Um, it can help. The one thing we have found about exercise, I'll tell you this, it attenuates your propensity to gain weight back. Like it prevents you from gaining weight that you've already lost back. Mm, interesting. So like if somebody lost 30 pounds and they're on an exercise program, the, being, being an active and exercise, is, you're less likely to gain that weight back. So that's something we definitely know that exercise does in terms of weight loss. Um, all the other stuff, it helps a little. Like literally they've done 
hundreds of studies on people. The amount of weight they lose from exercise only it's a, it, it is not much. You have to do both. You have to do both, and the diet part is the most uh, that makes the big. I mean, there, there's those studies done that were done on modern hunter gatherers, and it's, they thought they would be burning so many calories from all their activity, and they weren't. Their, your body just learns to adapt. So it's like exercise for fitness, mobility for quality of life, and then eat for you know maintaining a lean body. That's the, that would no, that was I, always the way I communicated. I completely agree with you. Um, Excellent. Well, I tell you what, Dr. Allo, this has been great. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate you coming on, and thank you for handing out the book to your patients. Yeah, no, I definitely Maybe don't. we'll give you – maybe we should hook him up with some kind of a, a code or something for his for his patients for some of our workout programs. Oh, that would work. Yeah, mm-hmm. so they could have I do access. have I do have a uh, weight loss uh, program that I sell to, to people. I mean, I give it away to my patients, but like uh, – like like the, the lectures I give to doctors I, I put on YouTube and mm-hmm. they they you know it's very scientific lots of research based stuff, it, but the general population like like you know I, I they're like oh, all this research like what does this mean to me so I have a I have a program that people can can get if you go to Dr Allo D R A L O no period D R A L O dot net there's a weight loss one on one course and it goes through like all the basics from like what is a calorie what is a macronutrient you know how to actually lose weight. There's a workbook that you can put in, you know, to calculate your calorie deficit and your protein intake, all that stuff. And then going through like a fitness program that if you want to do some weightlifting, you don't have to to lose weight. But if you want to, here's a basic compound lift type program that you can follow with like a schedule and everything. It's very simple. And I do some uh, basic exercise demonstrations to kind of show people how to do it or how to regress them even because my patients are usually older. Um, but but that is something I usually give to my patients as well. I'd, I would love to be like, hey, go to the resistant training revolution.com type in this code and boom, you can get it for, you know, whatever. Excellent. Excellent. Um, that would be awesome. All right. Well, Love thank it. you, man. Thank you. Thanks well, for what you're doing. Sure. No, yeah. uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Time, and man. thanks for coming on and actually talking to my audience. Yeah. That's Cause they're all fun. doctors usually. And when they hear like from someone who actually believes in the same stuff and has the research to back it, that makes a huge difference. So I really appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you. When you're always trying to eat little calories. This is very common for women. Your hormones get yes. really thrown off in a negative way. Your hormones make a very big difference. Your hormones can tell your body to build muscle or to gain body fat or to keep fat off or to get rid of muscle. Of course, it controls your libido, your energy, your 